The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect those of Millennials' Choice. Viewer discretion is advised. Hear me choking up right now. I'm, I'm choking. I just I, I don't want to say it, but for our audience, I could say you're tearing up. Yeah, I am. I'm, t I'm, I'm literally. I get sick every time I talk about it or think about it. You know, I had a guy with me, the old man Peruda, and he was dying of cancer. He says, "Kill me." Put a bullet in my hand. I said, I can't, bro. I can't. I can never pull the trigger. I could never be able to do that. I can't. I love you. You make a mistake. You get walked into a room by your best friend. You don't walk out of here. When you have revenge in your heart, you might as well dig two graves, one for you, one for them. The minute I went into the mafia, I always felt that sooner or later I'm going to get killed or go to prison for the rest of my life. Sammy the Bull Gravano, welcome back to the Millennials Choice Show and thank you for having us. You have an awesome set. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you again. My Appreciate pleasure. it. My pleasure. So this is the second interview that we're doing with you and we've got yes. amazing, amazing feedback from our audience. They love hearing from you. It's one of the best, if not the best, interview we have on our channel. And we decided, we said, we can't leave it virtual. We got to come in person and sit down with Sammy the Bulga final. So thanks for doing that. It's my pleasure. And you came back and we did the last interview. So when I was told they might come back and I immediately said, yes, you guys were gentlemen, you did a great interview. I was happy with it. So we can go on. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, Thank you. We'll talk about the third interview a little later, but yes, uh, we'll yeah. see what happens with that. <laughs> Sounds good. And I don't want you to feel like we're disrespecting you for looking down or looking on our phone. We want to get this right. So we made notes. I'm a big believer on writing things down. And so if we're looking down, don't feel like we're disrespecting No, no, no. You. That's no disrespect. That's fine. You got, I see it. I know what you're doing. So. But if he's falling asleep, feel free to <laughs> reach over and give him a little. Right. right, right. Give me a kick. Well, I got my dog here and, and she's trained. If somebody falls asleep, <laughs> give him a little bite. <laughs> Wake him up. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I smoke? Not cigar? at all. You sure? Not at all. Sure. We're happy to do that. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to smoke one with you. We should have brought our stones. Well, I can't, I can't make you smoke one with me, but. <laughs> we should have brought I want you to do while we started talking. So. Yeah, that's oh, true. Sure. That's true. I could pass away. So, some of the feedback we were getting from our first interview. People loved hearing from you, and they wanted to know more about your family. So, what was your family like when you were in the mafia? What's your family like now? What's your relationship with them? I saw you recently posted it was your son's birthday, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so, why don't you talk September. to September. September, and, and why don't you talk to us about... Ah, your family. Well, my personal family um, is my wife, my ex-wife. Now, uh, my daughter, my son, I am still close with them. Uh, my ex-wife, we broke up. It wasn't a bad thing. It was for a lot of different reasons. We're still like this. We're still super tight. She has COPD, and I take care of her as best I can. And uh, my daughter is was on a lot of shows, Mob Wives and different shows she was on. She was a producer at a certain point. She's in New York with my granddaughter, and she's great. She's like me. She's a little hot-headed, a little wants to throw punches right away if you bother her. So uh, one day she will put up her hands. I said, you want to fight me? Are you crazy or what? <laughs> so my son, a uh, great kid, he's 48 now. Um, and uh, he's got a couple of rabbits. He married a girl, I had a kid. So he's got that kid plus two that he did with us, one that he did with somebody else. So he's got a nice sized family, good kid. Ash, I shouldn't call him a kid, he's a man at 48. But uh, to me, everybody, once you hit a certain age, everybody's a kid, they're, yeah. they're younger than you. So I have a great family. They're very supportive of me. Um, the whole, I've got 22 years of my life in prisons and they've been by my side the whole time. Yeah. Whether it's commissary money that they send, books, cards, every holiday, every birthday, every everything. Um, so they stayed and every time I got out of prison, they were there waiting. And then when I went in, they would have said, they had to say goodbye. So they, I got a great family, a lot of love and a lot of respect for each other. And uh, we're still tight. 
So you became a granddad, and how was that for you? That was that was good. I mean, I was out the first time when they had uh, two of them, two grandchildren, and one of them I think was one, or the other one was three. When I went back in, I came out, they were grown a little bit, and that's life in prison. You, all these things happen to you. The people die, especially when you do a long bit. Um, my last bit, I did close to 18 years straight. So, uh, but, um, you know, th this is a tough life that I've been living in the mafia and stuff like that. But uh, I had a dual personality. I had, in the mafia, I was a little on the rough side. And then I had a good side where I was in businesses and real estate and construction and did a lot of different things. So uh, even Paul Castellano said, you know, a gangster is a, a thug, tough guy, does murders, does all kinds of things. And a racketeer is mostly business and stuff like that. And he said, uh, you know, it's uh, very rare that somebody is a gangster and a racketeer at the same time. He said, but we're lucky. We have a few guys like that. He pointed to, down the table and he said, Sammy's one of them. So I had two hats I would wear. I'm a little bit of a tough guy, a gangster, and a little bit of a racketeer, business-wise and union-wise, and he started using me in that field. So I had a very, you know, interesting life. Yeah. So, so during those challenging times, like the family, did it help you uh, get through it? Like sometimes we watch these movies and we see like the mob wives and they're involved. Uh, you watch Goodfellas and you see his wife was, you know, when they were coming to arrest them, they were she was dumping all the coke in the toilet and, and trying to hide it and things like that. So, um, like, were they, did they help you go through the challenging times while you were in the mafia? No. I hid that, not hid it, but I left that part of my life out of them. There was a reason. In other words, I always wanted my wife to be able to ask or answer questions legitimately where she could even take a lie detector test. So she didn't know about my criminal acts. I didn't. It wasn't shared at home. My home life was my home life. The street was my street life. And I didn't bring them together. I never brought my son in to become a made guy. Um, I thought it was the worst move possible. Why would I want to bring my son in who was going to become a target for the FBI? He might have to kill people. He might get killed. So I kept them completely separate. And uh, for a long time, I bought a horse farm in New Jersey, Cream Ridge, New Jersey. And when I went to that farm with my family, it was, I left everything behind me. Right. And I just enjoyed horses and going to different events with my wife and kids and stuff like that. They're not stupid. They heard stories, saw newspaper articles. But um, if there was any questions, I would tell them that's none of your business. Right. People do want to learn more about you aside from the mob stuff can you share with us any like hobbies or interests that you had aside from that life more on the personal side well like i said i had a horse farm my kids even when i was in staten island i bought a couple of horses for them to ride there was a stable in staten island i you know made the horses stay there and they went horseback riding and things like that and i went to all of their events and I took them to different things. We, when we traveled, I went to Puerto Rico a couple of times with my family and my kids. And it had nothing to do with the mafia. It was strictly enjoyment. I took them to Disney World when they were kids. So I wanted them to have a legitimate life. My mother and father were legitimate people. My father was a painter. My mother was a seamstress. And I know I, oh, I never forgot what I learned from them. Um, and I wanted to give them that kind of a bring up of being what they were, not not the mafia. It's it's a different organization, and I wanted to keep those two things separate. And I think I was pretty successful with that. They grew up with you know good. You know, I'll give you an idea. I, one time, my daughter, I think she was just turning eighteen years old. Um, and she wanted to go into business. I opened up a little florist. I knew a guy who was a florist. He quit his job and went to work with her. And I gave her the keys. I set the whole place up. I said, here's the keys. You own it. You open the store and you work for it every day. If you're not here, you lose it and that's it. 
I'm not giving you money. I'm not doing anything. You know, I did buy her gifts, but she had to work for what she had to get. Same thing with my son. So I brought them. I didn't want to give them money or wound them. They had to work. And thank God I did that because till today, they work. My daughter is an esthetician. She has a place she's opening up in New Jersey. Not only uh, is she opening up and she's an esthetician, she's doing all the construction work, doing, fixing the place herself like you're supposed to do. You're going to open it. Don't get anything on a silver platter. You got to work for it. You want special walls, build them. Go get a builder and talk to them. I'm not doing it for you. Yeah. So I try to teach them that and in life. I didn't want to teach them the mafia. That wasn't part of their life. I, I was a bad kid growing up my whole life. I was in gangs. That life hit me like a glove. So I wound up going through it yeah. most of my life. And when I was, I went to prison in 90, I was with John Gotti in 91. I cooperated and I left the life. It's a whole story. I mean, a lot of people know it, so I won't bore people with the whole story. I left the life, changed my life. Um, I got arrested again for ecstasy in Arizona. And I got a 20 year sentence. I did almost 18 years, 17 years, seven months. And I got out and I didn't know what to do. I was dead broke. Um, when I got out, I had $430 in my pocket and my daughter let me live with her. I didn't have any clothes. I had nothing. They bought me some jeans, some clothes, stuff like that. I went uh, to try and get social security. I came out of prison when I was 72. Uh, I was fighting for that. Um, I couldn't get any kind of insurance because I had no history of background. So I was a soldier, I was in the military, so I went to the VA, I was being treated over there. Um, and I went for food stamps. And uh, my son told me about social media. I started working with social media. And then I, people were talking to me about doing a movie about my life. And they started working with Hollywood. And, um, and that's where I am now, and I can't think of a better place to uh, social media. I'm meeting guys like you guys, straight up, legitimate, good people. Thank you. I enjoy that. I enjoy the conversations. I enjoy the opportunity to talk and do a show with you guys. Help your numbers go up, and I, I feel good about what I do now I and what I became now. So I changed my life. I'm friendly with Michael Francis. I just did a big interview with him. Um, he changed his life. We got together. We had a great time. We did a, a pretty big video. And uh, I'm in the same thing. I've changed my life, you know. So I don't do any crimes or anything like that or murders. Um, what do you like to do for fun? I, what I like to do for fun. At, I'm 78 now. There's not a lot of things you do for fun anymore, but I go to parties and things like that. I'm invited to people's houses. You know, I couldn't have been all that bad because I have people who knew me from 30, 40 years ago are in touch with me now. They're on my platform. They reach me all the time. They come out here. They have parents out here. They'll invite me over their houses. I go over their houses. We'll go in the pool. We'll hang out. That's what's good. You know, uh, I mean, I don't have every physical, like when I was younger, I played ball, handball, racquetball. I did a lot of things, even in prison. But um, that's a little too rough for me now. You know, my aches and pains have aches and pains when you hit a certain age. Yeah. So I kind of tone it down. I still go to the gym and then pretty decent shape for my age. But there's not too many sports or anything I can do. I went skiing once and I almost broke my leg. Me too. I hate skiing personally. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. You know, the first time I really stood up, I was must have been doing 90 miles an hour. I didn't know how to stop. Yeah. <laughs> the way, only way I stopped there, as I was passing people, I would grab their arm and get right and stop myself. And I would grab them down the mountain. And a couple of people told me, listen, don't come skiing no more. I tried it. It wasn't for me either. And I said, that's right. okay. I'm right. cool with that. Right. We got the Mustang parked out front. If you want to. Do some donuts do some, in the parking lot. It's all yours. You know, I wanted to do something. I told my team, the girls, that I have something on my bucket list before I die. I, I drive cars. I, I drove getaway cars, and I, I'm a fast driver. I would love to go on a track day 
you could rent the car, yeah. the outfit, and race the car around and do that. I would love to try that. I think they were doing 188 miles an hour. Damn. I would love to see what that's like. They yeah. give you the supercars, like the Lamborghinis and stuff? They give you the supercar. Yeah, yeah. You rent the car. You rent the track. You rent the outfit. That's cool. And uh, the first time you go in, there's a guy with you, and he can slow it or do something. And he's talking to you and showing you how it goes. And then uh, I'll take over. I did that when we had racehorses. Okay, cool. The guy's showing me how to work things and do things. And and uh, I bought a good, pretty good racehorse. And they were trotters and paces where the horse is running. You're sitting on a little cart behind him. So the trainer cool. stood on the side yeah. on the pole and he was telling me what to do. When they jog, they go a certain way, clockwise. Oh. When they race, they go counterclockwise, wow. right? So he says, don't turn the horse to go counterclockwise because it knows it'll take off on you. That's so we were jogging it, jogging it. I said, listen, I want to try it. No, you can't. I bought the horse. It was my farm. So I pushed him off the side and I turned the horse around. Wow. This thing oh. took off, yeah. my God. I was pulling with all my might, and I was pretty strong back then. It was hard to hold him back. Wow. I knew what he was talking about. But I, I do a lot of you know stuff, a lot of things. Um, I got a great team, great girls. Uh, most, of, most of them are girls. Um, and a, a great team. We connect real good. Um, we do a lot of things, social media, Hollywood. They're both knowledgeable, very knowledgeable of it. Uh, Amina did a little acting, and she's knowledgeable of the field. So uh, she's knowledgeable, and we're working with her. She might even be in a movie down the road uh, trying nice. to make. Uh, Anna went to school, college, the same thing. And then uh, as she went back to college and to become a psychologist, she's graduated. She gets her degree in December. And then she's going to continue to get her master's degree. But she says, I'm just going to hang them on the wall. I want to work here. That's this awesome. is my career. Yeah. So I got really smart women who have knowledge of the business. So for me to be around them like that, I'm the worst with tech, stuff like that. I'm finished. So they know all of that. They run it. And I have a great time with them. They're very loyal. And I love that. It's yeah. on the street. Everything's about loyalty. I respect they're very loyal. The principles I heard you mention already, even with about your kids, I just want to, before we leave that subject, you didn't give them fish. You taught them how to fish. And so they're on their own, but they're dependent. You wanted them to be that way, yes. which is amazing. And then the second thing that I just heard is you surround yourself with the right people, the right team. Yes. Yeah. The right people. And I'm a master at that. You know, being in the life, you analyze people. Because a life, your life or somebody else's life depends on it. So you have to focus in on people. I've never lost that ability. I focus in and then I see good people. I recognize it. You know, I had a guy who wanted me to sell uh, some, uh, what do you call that, uh, drugs? Or, what do you call that? Nutraceuticals. Okay. And the guy came in and I could make money by selling it. He's telling me this whole story. And I said, well... If you sell them, the date, it's almost expired. It don't matter. What do you mean it don't matter? By the time we mail it out, it's already expired. Right. And we're giving it to people to get healthy and stuff. And it won't it won't matter. And I told him, yeah, yeah, all right. Goodbye. Take care. I told Amina, tell him, no, I'm not interested. Yeah. You know, I could spot right away. He's, he don't care about the people's health. He cares about money and his pocket. His pocket, and I, I said no. I, I recognize that one, two, three. I, I said no, no, no argument or not, but I'm not interested in yeah. that kind of bullshit. So I, I do some advertisements. Uh, let's say it's food. I always want to try the food. Yeah. So why do you want to try it? Because if I eat it and it tastes like shit, I'm not going to tell yeah. people this is the best the fucking best food you can have. <laughs> Everybody will say, Sammy, one thing about him, he's got no sense of taste. Yeah. <laughs> it's a thing that's horrible. <laughs> so if, it's hor if I think it's horrible, you can't pay me to talk about it. It's Unless like, you want me to talk about it, then it's shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like in real estate. Like in where we're from, we got a lot of people in the real estate industry. It's the largest real estate board in the world. 
because everybody can just be a realtor. They think it's fast money. They get in and more than half of them have part-time jobs and they're not doing well. Um, but when I talk to my clients, I say, I wouldn't try to give you this if I wouldn't buy it. And a lot of the times if we're dealing with investments, I also invest just to show them my money's in this too. So either we're both going to make a lot of money, we're all going to make a lot of money, or we're all going to lose money. Either way, we're in the same boat. Right. And it gives us transparency, right? See, and that's something I would want to hear. Yeah, yeah. In other words, and I, we can't make money in everything we do, but if you're trusting the whole group and you're going together, I mean, that's what people want. Yeah. That's what I would want. So if you're dealing with a scam artist, I'm, I'm not interested. Yeah. I'm totally not interested. We've been burned. Uh, I've been burned. Yeah. You've been burned. And I'm sure, you know, in, in your life, there's been moments where you learn from that and mm -hmm. in your past life and you're like, okay, I don't want to make that mistake again. It costed me and whatnot. Um, I wanted to touch on one more thing when you said you had $430 to your name when you got out of prison mm -hmm. and your daughter let you stay with her. And then you got on like food stamps and, and you're trying to get on social security. Like, what did that feel like for you as like a man, as someone who was a big earner, somebody who's now turning the page in his life? and you had to go through that, was there a part of you that said, man, like this doesn't feel good, but I have to do what I have to do to survive right now? No, I have no ego when it comes to things. I was taught you have to work for everything you got. I went to prison, I lost everything I had. It was time to dig in and regain yourself, no matter. You, 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 it's, nothing is beneath me. If people gotta go for food stamps because they're broke, I'm broke. I ain't no special person. I'm owed nothing. I go for food stamps just like everybody else went for food stamps. I don't feel embarrassed about it. Um, it's just something I got to do to keep going and survive. And then there's steps. You just have to keep gaining and going forward. Now, I tell everybody when I talk a lot of times, I say, don't worry about money when you're going into business or whatever you're doing. Worry about success. Success is like a magnet for money. You achieve success, people like you, people trust you, money will follow. Don't worry about it, it will follow. It's like a magnet. So worry about those things. So me, I was worried about how to eat, that my daughter was gonna feed me and I couldn't chip in. So I got food stamps and then brought it home. I was happy about that I was able to, to bring the food stamps and we were able to buy food. Not that she's buying food for me all the time and I'm going to King Tut and I'm going to sit on my ass. So I, I, I played my part as best as I could. I love that. That's such a strong person's mindset because a lot of people would say, I'm not cleaning up uh, the toilets. I'm not cleaning the floors. I'm not washing dishes. But yet they're broke and you know they might have to provide whether it's for themselves or somebody else. But they're not willing to do what it takes. Like when, you know, before we got in the business, we were washing dishes. We were cooking actually at Johnny Rockets. You, you, you guys know Johnny Rockets here, the hamburger place? Yeah. The old fashioned diner. So we actually visited yesterday, posted on our social and said where it all began. But a lot of people would have too much pride for that. And it's like, I don't call that pride. I, I don't know what it is. I listen, I am up off the bottom. I still could get the girls, maybe they should be on the show. I wash dishes. And my stuff, when I'm done eating, I don't just bring it or give it to somebody to wash it. I go in the kitchen and I wash it. My dog goes to the bathroom, I go pick it up. I clean, I vacuum. I do things when they're not here. Yeah. When I see things, I don't just see things and leave it alone so somebody else is going to do it. I don't think I'm, I'm, that's not me. If I see something, I'm going to bend down and pick it up or vacuum or clean it. I'm not embarrassed over the end of that. I love that. I mean... You have to do those things. And when you think uh, your shit don't stink, then something's wrong with you. And people, how are you going to get loyalty? People won't respect that. Yeah, yeah all the bullshit, he dumps it on us. No. He's not even willing to. And I just asked me, yeah. well, before this interview, you want coffee? I said, I'll make it. And I made my own cup of coffee. I asked you for, it's okay for me to smoke. Um, some people wouldn't do that. It's beneath me. Why should I ask them? This is my place. This is my yeah. thing. I, I don't look at it that way. I'm not that kind of person. I don't look at, you know, when I got out of prison, um, you know, Sammy the Bull, and uh, 
a lot of people in Hollywood knew who I was, but uh, they didn't give a fuck. Who gives a shit? He sent me the book. What's his numbers? What is he doing? They want to know things like that. They don't care no more what my past life was. They want to know what's his present life? What is he doing now? Is he scheming? Is he stealing? Is he robbing people? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? The answer is no to all of those questions. So they're real comfortable in doing business with me. I don't want to mention the guy's name, but he's a big producer. And I told him I was a little bit short in the cash department. We were ready to sign the contract. Um, my lawyer said, uh, Sammy, the guy sent down 30000 They get a percentage, small percentage. And he sent me down the money. So I said, uh, something's wrong. That is normal. We didn't even sign the contract. How does he know to send me 30000 So he said, I don't know, but he did. Then when I talked to him, I said, listen, bro, why did you send me down that money? We, we didn't even have a contract yet. How could you get it back? Uh, Sammy, we came to an agreement. I trust your handshake. And you needed money, and I gave you the money up front. I'm not worried about it. That says and something that, about your character. It yeah. said something about my character. That, and I love the fact that he trusted my word. He trusted my handshake. Um, and that impresses me. That makes me love the guy. I mean, so, um, and we still didn't sign it. We're, we're on the verge of signing it now because there was this actor strike and, and the right. writers, the writers and directors settled. The actors are still going, but that doesn't mean nothing. I'm at that uh, point anyway, so I'm able to write and pick uh, directors and stuff like that. And when the actors, you know, strike is over, we'll get really going 100%. And uh, well, now the lawyer's talking to me yesterday, I think, right, at it? Uh, yesterday, and uh, now they want to sign the contracts, and I'm ready. So it reminds me of my first real estate deal. I was 19 years old. My mom pissed me off because I brought, I brought a deal home. I had 15 grand. She told me, no, save your money. And at the time, I didn't realize because they lost everything back home coming to Canada. And they just wanted me to be, not make a mistake and, and not lose my money. So I was really pissed off and I found this other deal and I really wanted to do it. So I just didn't even tell them. They, not, they weren't helping me, my parents, but it was just because we're so family oriented, we involved them. And I said, you know what? They're, they're speaking into my ear for other reasons. Let me just go do it on my own. What's the worst that could happen? And when I went to the guy's office, I thought I was getting like a really good deal. And I, and I somewhat did now that the market did well. But when I was looking at the guy and I said, I need the payment plan to be this way. I said, okay, you got checks. So yeah, I got checks. I didn't I didn't have a checkbook or anything, but I know I can get checks from the bank. He said, okay, go get your checks and come back. And I said, if I leave here, I'm going to go and I'm going to come back. This deal needs to be like solid. So I stuck out my hand. I, shook, I said, I'm old school like that. If I shake your hand, it means it's a done deal. Right. I just got to go and get the checks or the paperwork or whatever, but that's going to happen. So yeah, I, I respect a lot of that. Yeah. If you're a big shot, you want to be a big shot or whatever you want to be. That make your handshake mean mean something. Yeah. That'll make you a big shot. When people they don't fear me as much anymore. They understand that if I give them my word or I give them a handshake, I'm there for you. That's more important than anything. Fear is one thing, but love and respect is a whole nother thing. You have to earn that love and respect. The only way to earn that is not out of fear. It's out of how you conduct yourself. Yeah. yeah. The consistency of who you are. Your who you are, your, your character, your, your word is your bond, stuff like that yeah. is everything. Everybody thinks I get things because of my past. It's not from my past at all. From my past, they'll run away. They're scared. But you have to earn that. Now, it's a hard, harder thing for me to earn it because I do have that past. Right. So now I have to really earn it. Yeah. So now, guys... They're not afraid of my past. They know I gave my word and I'm going to live up to it. Now, if things went haywire and I couldn't sign this contract, even if I didn't have the money, I would take a loan. I would beg, borrow, and steal to pay this guy back. Yeah. And I don't have to. There's no contract. There's no nothing. I have an old story about a contract that years ago when I was in the life. I was a heavyweight. And a Jewish contractor knew when I was controlling unions, so it was... And I had a big company, uh, a drywall company. I had 200 employees. 
and I was able to do the work. So they would, they would give me the work. And I was able to solve some of their union problems, even if it wasn't one of mine, it was a problem with the electricians. I didn't have the electricians, but I knew somebody who did, so I could help them. So he gave me a piece of the job. No contracts, no nothing, handshake. And uh, well, during that job, it was a the job was called a bastard. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. You bought bolts, bolts, and the, the nut that goes on it didn't fit. Everything was a problem. So at the end of the job, he called me up. My brother-in-law, Eddie, was sitting next to me, and he said, uh, Sammy, we're going to take a tremendous loss. So I said, well, I know the job is going bad, so let's just go and put a full blast in sort of the losses a little bit less. How, mu how much do you think I'm going to lose? 300, 350,000. I said, all right, all right. But let's put a push so maybe we can get that number down a little bit. And uh, so I hung up. My brother-in-law was sitting next to me and he says, uh, Sammy, you're not going to pay that number, right? I said, why wouldn't I pay it? He said, you don't have a contract. He's a Jew. What is he going to do? I said, you're right. He can't do anything. Really? What could he do to me? Can't sue me. Can't beat me up. He can't do anything. Really? But who in the fuck would ever do another job with me if I do that? And uh, you are you're crazy. All right. It came down, we, I wound up losing 250000 and I paid it. And uh, a couple of weeks, a month of most later, another Jewish contractor called me up and said, Sammy, how you doing? Good. He says, I heard you took a good beating on that job. You lost 350000 I said, no, I didn't. I lost 250000 He said, but you paid it. I said, yeah. He says, I don't know of a gangster who would do that. You lived up to your word. You didn't have to pay it. There was no reason, but you paid it. The reason was I was partners. I, was, I would have got my end if it worked, and I paid my loss. Yeah. That was my reason. He said, that's great. That's great. I have a job. I want to give you peace, and I want to give you the drywall contract. I said, all right. And they were both friends, the two Jews. Okay. So came back. I yeah, come back. Right, yeah. I made 700000 on that job between the drywall, my percentage of the profits, 700000 I grabbed my brother-in-law and I said, look, bro, do you think he would have gave me this job if I would have beat him? Absolutely not. So. No, uh, no, absolutely no. not. Yeah. So what goes around comes around. I don't give a fuck who you are or who you think you are. If you act like a fucking man's man, and that's a man, not a tough guy. Man's man are good men. People will go out. People like you will go out and you work and you hustle and you're trying to build your business. You're being honorable. You're coming around doing interviews. You flew down here. You brought me a couple of gifts. I appreciate it. Uh, but it wasn't for that. It was for that. The last time I did an interview, you were great. I had a tremendous respect for you. You. When they told me they called back, they would like to do it again. Absolutely. That's a man's man. You're, you're a man. A guy who goes to work every day and busts his fucking ass to support his family, that's a man. That's a man's man. My father was had nothing to do with the mafia whatsoever, or my mother. And they work like dogs. Those are good people. I understand that because I had that. So... I've taken that part of me from my mother, my father, the mafia. I've learned not only from the mafia. When I was 19, I got drafted into the army during the Vietnam War, and I was taught how to kill, what to do. They're communists. They're coming here. They're going to rape your mother, your sisters. So you got to hear all bullshit lies. Yeah. So you're training to learn that. And then I was in a gang, and then in the mafia, in and out of jail. So my life was rough and I learned that. But thank God I learned to segregate what my mother and father were, what good people are, and what bad people are. I was a bad person, a bad boy at one time. So, you know, good people, they're real men. They go to work, 
they, maybe they don't kill anybody, which is good. That's a good person. You don't have to be a tough guy to be a fighter or a killer or nothing like that. That's that's part of a life. If I was in the military, I would have killed. Yeah. And I would have got a slap on the back. Good job. When I killed, I you represented, yeah, you get a medal. Yeah. When I killed, I was in Gozanostra in the mafia. And I killed four the mafia, four to protect the mafia. I never killed a woman, a legitimate guy, or a kid. It was strictly people. We took an oath, you live by the rules or you died by the rules. Sometimes you died, sometimes you did the killing. I um, fortunately didn't die, but I was part of doing the killing. I was a hit guy of mega proportions. I was good at it. And I was used by different bosses, the Colombo family, then the Gambino family, Paul Castellano, then John Gotti. I didn't even want to do half the shit I was doing, but I was good at it and I was chosen to do it. And when I'm chosen and I'm given an order, this is what you're going to do, I do it. Could you picture a soldier in the military being told to go into this town and do something? And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Of course he's going to do it. Even the, even the Nazis did that. Right. Even the Nazis right. did that, right? And whether they thought it was right or wrong, that was their job. Yeah. And they've gotten brave. That, you know, Nazis were, they were horrible people. Horrible. But, the, but not all the Germans. And like you're saying, some of those German people went into the military and they followed orders. Yeah. You know, so you can't hate all the Germans because of what Germany, the Nazis did. It wasn't all of Germany. That's true. So, um, on that on that note, you were you're talking about, you know, you've said this in the past, your past interviews, and I believe you said it on our interview as well, where everyone knew what they were signing up for when they were getting into the mafia. Absolutely. Either you were going to end up in jail, in, or you might have ended up getting killed. Right. right. You're sitting with us here today, so does a part of you. There's a part of you. You have you have an awesome team. You've got a platform. You're changing people's lives, prison reform, all kinds of good things. Does a part of you ever? And this might sound like a, a silly question, so don't don't no, 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 don't God. react to that weird thing. But does a part of you ever think to yourself and say, "I should still be in prison for life, or I should have been taken out on the streets"? Does a part of me? Does that ever enter your mind? Um. There's a couple of times that I, I, I'm not a, a, a guy who files certain religions. And there's a lot of different religions. I do believe in God. There's times I was shot twice, stabbed once, and I would pray to God and say, God, do I have a guardian angel? How am I surviving some of these things? And if so, tell me, is there a purpose for me to survive this? Is there something you want from me? So this goes to your question. Um, I did what I did at certain times in my life. I thought they were right. Um, I followed them to the T. I do it now with my team or I do something. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example. Anna's mother got sick. Anna told me, she said, my mother's sick. She's gonna go out of town for a week. And I said, go ahead. It's a family, go take care of them. Boom, they took care of him. The girl who does the books said, uh, well, she's not in all week. Should I take get rid of pay for the week? I said, no. Why? Because she's doing what she's got to do, which is important. It's important to me. She's shown me what she is as a person. No, I'm not going to. She'd get paid the full pay like she was here. You have to recognize certain things, like when you're going to deduct somebody's pay or do something. I mean, I don't normally do that. And I look at things and what people have done. I look at myself and what I've done. I have no regrets of what I've done. And I look back at even my prison time. I've learned how to become me now. So many things in my life. I went to prison uh, for ecstasy, I got a 20 year sentence. I did 17 years, seven months. I first six and a half years of that time was in the hole. I hated it. It was so lonely. It was, it was I've never felt loneliness like that in my life. I'm happy it was not to me. I know 
I felt things that I would not not normally feel. I felt hate. I felt love. I felt things that make you. It's when you're a strong person and you had serious problems, life or death situations, all that, you become stronger. If you're a weak person and these things hit you, you become weaker. I'm a strong person. I lived through those things. I have no regrets. Um, you know, if you could change them, some people would say, some of the things, if I could change them, I would. But I wasn't in control of changing them, so it's that question is mute. I think a lot of people, when they hear you say, I don't have regrets, I think what they're misunderstanding is you're not, you're not saying, yeah, I, you know, if I could, if I can go back, maybe I wouldn't have done this or not done that. Maybe you, you would. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But, but I think the, where, what they're misunderstanding is that you learned from all of your life experience. Absolutely. So you don't regret going through prison, as you just said, because you learned so much from it. That's right. And it makes you the per person you are, the person I am today. So maybe if I was a different person, I would say, yeah, she's not here all week. Don't pay it. Yeah. Like a lot of corporations and companies would don't. Yeah, or screw these guys. We don't want to do another interview with them or whatever. Right. Yeah, whatever. Right. Unless yeah. they give me X dollars yeah. or I, yeah. I don't care that they're struggling and trying to get ahead and they're doing the right thing. Yeah. I don't care. But I do care. I, I've, those things taught me in life a lot of things. So when I say I have no regrets, of course I have regrets. I mean, some people died. I mean, if you could change that, would I change it? Of course I would. But I couldn't. And I've learned from those things. I learned what violence does. If I ever wanted to die or you wanted to die, you would want to get shot in the head. It's instantaneous. And you're dead. There's no suffering, there's no nothing. I think it's the best way to die. But the people around you don't feel that. They feel pain, they feel suffering. I've seen all of that. So I've learned things in life, and that's what I mean when I say I have no regrets. It's made me what I am now. I'm sympathetic to certain things, to certain people. Um, certain situations, uh, it's made me a better person. I didn't make those negative things make me a person who's worse or thinking that uh, I give the dishes, she'll wash the fuck, fuck her, she'll wash the dishes or something else. I don't look at myself that way. I, I, it's, so it's made me a better person, I think. Um, and, you know, do, did I like six and a half years in a whole? Fuck no. But in a way, it's t it taught me so many different things. I just got done doing an interview with the warden, who was the warden of the ADX Supermax. The guy sent me a beautiful letter, card. We started corresponding. We did an interview with him. It's a three-part episode. It will be coming out the later part of this month. And he had a tremendous respect on how I did time, how I did my time, and how I conducted myself. Six and a half years in a whole, people fall apart. They lose their mind. They hang themselves. They do all kinds of things. Um, that didn't happen to me. And I've learned what it is, that solitude, that, that, conf, that kind of confinement. I'm fighting for prison control, now, uh, prison reform now. Um, that's what's made me do those things. Yeah. You can't make somebody better in prison when you treat them like shit. The warden of the ADX Supermax did not do that. He sympathized. He was the warden. He had to follow rules. But he sympathized with people who were doing the time. He said something to the girls and in the letter and in the interview. And he says, uh, Sammy, I came by with all heavyweights with government and the news media by yourself. The cell door opened up and we were standing there, a pack of us, and some of them wanted to ask you questions. And then you turned around and said, Warden, did you hear I got really good news? And he said, no, I didn't hear. What happened? I said, I saved a ton of money on my car insurance by changing to Geico. <laughs> <laughs> now, they all looked at me. People had their mouths open when they walked away. 
a couple of them said he lost his mind. He re- he's doing life. I mean, yeah. he, he'll never get out more than likely. And this is making a joke about. So he said, no, he's got a sense. He's still got a sense of humor. He's still got everything going. So, and I and the way I conducted myself, he came back. We're friends now. He's going to help me with prison reform because he thinks that punishment is too excessive. And, uh, you know, I talk about people who are in prison and stuff like that. So it's made me, everything that happened in my life has made me who I am now. Now, would I be fighting for some people who are in prison to get out? Of course, I know it's totally unfair. I have a guy, Bobby Manor, who was the cousin of the Genovese family. He's 91, I guess, because I've been fighting with him for a while, for him for a while. I guess maybe he's 92 now. Okay. He's been in prison over 40 years, sick as a dog. Let him out so he could die at home with his family. He's not going to crack an egg. He's not going to do anything. So I would tell the judges or the people who make those decisions, you say, I'm a bad guy, you're a good guy. You, you're worse than me. You just want to grind this person's life to nothing yeah. until he's dead. And then his family, you're hurting all of them. You're not better than me. Yeah. You're the same as me or worse. Yeah, that kind of situation, like it makes sense. He's 91 years old. What's he gonna do? No, and he's not gonna do anything. He's dying. I mean, you said like he's sick. He's got forty years, and he's here, and he's dying. He's sick. I mean, so, and then these are things that are making me fight for prison reform. Things I went through. So, what I know, all of the what I know now, if I didn't go through this life. So, when I say I, I, I have no regrets about a lot of things. Of course, I regret being in a hole for six and a half years. I regret murders that happened. People who not the people who died. A lot of those people deserve to die. Just like if you went to Vietnam, some of those soldiers deserve to die. But their women and their children with bombs, they didn't deserve to die. So there's a, a good and a bad in that whole thing. Could we change what happened in the Vietnam War? No. Could we learn from it? Yes. Could we change slavery, what they did? To black people? No. no. It happened back then. Could we learn from it and change? Yes. And there's wars and things all over the world. It's, I'm going to pick one or two things. There's hundreds of things. I know a couple of times when I said I have no regrets, I got some negative comments. But they're thinking in a closed-minded way. They're thinking you have no problem that you killed people and you did this and you, you did that. They're thinking... That's that's what they're thinking, right. but they're they're misunderstanding. You're talking about the lessons and what's led you to where you are right. today. And if they ever listen to my podcast and listen to me closely, they would see in my voice how it tears me to fuck up when I even talk about it sometimes, because I can visualize it and I know the fucked up part. So when I tell the story, it's not that I'm taking telling the story, gloating or doing something. My half of the times. Uh, maybe it's my older age. I don't. I never cried in my life too much, but I almost get to the point where I choke up and I can't even completely tell the story. So of course I have regrets about that and what happened, but there's nothing I could do to change it. It was the time. It was what happened. It's what I was fighting for. What I believed in. So I have regrets about it, but I can't. I. You know, was, I, I, there's a lot of guys who go to prison. And uh, after a while, they found Jesus and they found God and they found this and they found that. People ask me that question. I said, no, I didn't find him. I never found Jesus. I always believed in God, so I didn't have to find him. I didn't find certain things. And I asked some of the guys who had said it in prison, I found Jesus. Good. Where'd you find him? What cell was he in? What was he dressed like? They can't answer those questions. You found Jesus. That's fucking bullshit. You turn around. I found Jesus. You want to get out. And I'm not saying... A lot of the music. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. of course. They they use it left and right. Religion. and They use religion. Or I found this and I found that. And they found... You found that you got enough time and you want to say any fucking thing to get out. Now, I'm not saying all of them do that. Some people 
maybe they did find it that way. Everybody's looking for a way to for forgiveness and to do certain things. Right. I'm a realist. Um, I don't know about finding anything or how God's going to treat me. I think that when these people bullshit, God's going to be a little more hateful towards that. You use my name in vain. You lied about me. You didn't believe in me. Yeah. Well, that's true. And then we believe that God made us. He made lions and he made lambs. I'm a fucking lion. Yeah. At any time, I will tell God if and when I meet him. You could have stopped me at any time. You have that kind of power. Why didn't you stop me? So I was gonna, we were going to lead into this question, and that was a perfect segue. You, you believe in heaven or hell? You believe in both? I don't believe there's a hell. I believe, I don't even know if it's heaven. I don't know what it is. I think planet Earth it is heaven and hell combined. It could be heaven, heavenly. Depending on how you go, you don't have to have money. You could have a great fucking family and a great life. That's heavenly. My mother and father had heaven on earth. Uh, hell, I, I, you know, I heard a comedian one time say, you know, if they were talking about Catholics, if you don't come through Jesus Christ, you're not coming to heaven. You can say, you know, for, ask for forgiveness and they'll give it to you. It's very generous. But if you don't come to Jesus Christ, he'll send you to hell, you'll burn, you'll suffer for eternity. He don't sound that fair to me. I mean, he's a little hateful. He wants to just make them burn and suffer eternity. Because like, that's one of the biggest misconceptions I feel like a lot of people have regarding like Christianity in general. Because I think the biggest difference between that and what the real belief is, I don't think God wants anyone to burn, right? And that's why, no. you know, in the Christian faith, what we believe is he sent Jesus to come down to die for us so that people could have an opportunity to live. Because realistically speaking, the only difference between heaven and hell is heaven you're with God and hell you're not with God. Because God obviously won't force anyone to live with it. But that's what the way they put it. Now, um, yeah. Jesus you just made a statement. Um, Jesus put his son on a cross to be tortured, beaten, nailed to a cross to save everybody else for their sins. I find a hard time to swallow that Fair. because you know, I have a hard time with that. I And listen, if you're bad guys, I would not put my son on a cross and torture him like that to save you guys. I will. I don't know how God could do that. If he wanted to save those guys, he could save them. If he wanted to torture them, he could torture them. Whatever he wanted to do. Right. He didn't need to torture his son. I think that's something that they... Sounds great. Sounds great. He did this to his own son. So do I buy that? I, I, I have a hard time. I bite it, but I don't swallow it. I love the, I love the transparency. We had no plan to go down this This is great, this conversation. like, And I want to... What about this way? Have, have you heard it? Have you heard it presented this way? So, let's say, let's say you and I, maybe we shouldn't say. Let's say Danny and I. <laughs> Danny and I, we go out. We could commit a murder. They catch us. We go in front of a judge, and they're gonna throw the book at us, life sentences. And I go in front of the judge and I go, "Hey, judge, it's my younger brother. He's got his life ahead of him. Just give it to me. Only me." I'll, I'll do his time or whatever case may be. It's already a life sentence. And if that judge was a good and honest judge, he'll look at me and say, what the hell are you talking about? You both committed the crime. You're both going to do the time. So I think if you're God and you're looking at this, everyone to you, if God is this thing, this being that's supposed to be all powerful, all knowing, perfect, than anything that humans do, we make mistakes every day. So anything we do doesn't come up to that standard of, of God. And so if that judge is a good and honest judge, they'll put us both in prison. So if God is a good and honest God, technically by our own actions, nothing, we can never do anything to amount to his standard. No. So if he's a good and honest God, which we would want to believe in a good and honest God, not a corrupt God, 
then he's going to throw all of us in hell, not because he wants to, but because he has no choice. It's right, and it's right and just. We cannot conform to his standard. I never heard it said that way, but that's a pretty good way of saying it. So he wouldn't throw us in hell and he wouldn't bring us to heaven. In other words, this is heaven and hell. If he created us, and I believe I'm an artist as well, I do artwork. Um, I look at the sky and sunset or sunrise, and they say, oh, who can do that kind of art? Who can do that? There's got to be a God. There's so many beautiful things that there has to be a God. So it's like, yeah. But he's not going to interfere with us in any way, shape, or form. It's, your life is now. There's Wicc Wiccans, they have a different religion. I studied a couple of different religions while I was in prison. Wiccans? Wiccans. Okay. And um, they believe that we are basically, um, what do they call it, this power in our body. The, the spirit? The, the, not a spirit. Uh, in other words, our body becomes, it dissolves. And that chemistry or whatever they call it, I forgot goes out and it goes out to the planet. It feeds the trees, the grass, the animals, other people. It's not that you become another person, but you're gone. You're gone. Your, your, your existence is over. Right. And they believe in the woman is more powerful than God. God, they have a lot of gods. Okay. The woman is, in Wiccan is the is the most powerful one. She is because of the fact that she needs a man's seed, but she creates life in her body. Man can't do that. She can get his sperm and create a, 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 a person. And then through giving birth, she creates life. So she's the creator. And they call her the goddess of the planet on the moon, the water, and the earth. She's the goddess. Then there's gods. Now, the most powerful god starts to die in the fall. He starts to lose his power. During the winter, he starts to die. Before he dies, she takes him and puts him in her womb and feeds him and keeps him alive. Spring comes, she gives birth to him again, and he's there. And then she, it's a whole cycle of how the plants live, stuff like that. It's a very interesting, yeah, it's a very interesting religion. And it's why she's the head person is because she can take the God and put him in our world and feed him until she gives birth to him again so he doesn't die. And uh, it's you know, so all these religions have different uh, things. I was in Indian ceremonies, and um, I forgot when it was, 2004, something like that. They stopped smoking in all the prisons, okay. especially okay. federal prisons. I wanted to smoke, and I would go out into the yard, and there was Indians, Native American Indians, sitting in. They had blankets around them. If There wasn't a teepee, but it was blankets around them. They would have a, a shell and they would burn stuff and and do their ceremony and stuff like that. Okay. And they were able to smoke in the pipe. Mm. There was an Indian tobacco. It had twigs in it and everything, but <laughs> they could smoke and pass it around. Yeah. And uh, so I went to them and I said, listen, that you're actually smoking that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Could I join the group? And he said, well, you have to go ask the chaplain and the counselor in federal prison, they could change your religion. Okay. So I said, all right, but I would be accepted with you guys. Yeah. So I went to the chaplain, I went to the unit you know, manager, and they changed me from being a Christian to an Indian. And I joined the group simply to smoke and steal some of the tobacco so I could bring it back to my cell at night, light it up and smoke <laughs> it when the gods did this little bullshit walk around. I got to respect their religion, and uh, I started to understand it and learn it. And it's a little, it's not that complicated, but they have a great, you know, thing. They believe in grandfather, not Jesus Christ. They believe it's old grandfather. 
that's their path to God. Right. Wicca has another path. Jews have another path. Muslims have another path. Everybody's got a path to God. And I used to say, why are we all fighting if we all believe in God? It's just your path. His path is different than yours. And it started to wane on my belief in different religions because they're all different. They all have different stories that make sense to them. Just like Jesus was put on the cross and that story makes sense to people. They love it. And it's a good story. Is it true? I, would God do that to his own son to save other sinners? I wouldn't. If I was God, you could bank on it. I'm not putting my son on the cross to save anybody. So, um, makes you makes you really wonder about the about the, whole, the about the whole like life love cycle, aspect, and life, everything, and how all that works. But especially if if that is true about uh, the sacrifice, the love that it must have taken for that group of people to to put up the son, because you must really love these people if you're willing to do that. Because as you said, as you a father, must, like I, yeah. I'm thinking, like we just became dads. Yeah. I can't fathom yeah. that idea. Me, either. I, I have fathom. a daughter, and I have a son, and I have grandchildren, and I could never do it. Yeah, you couldn't pay me. You could put a gun in my mouth and say, "If you do it, or I'm going to blow your head off." I would tell him, "Pull the trigger," because I can't do it. Yeah. and I'm a tough guy, and I did murders. I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. I just couldn't do it. And betraying my friends, I feel the same way. I can't do certain things. You know, as bad as you think I am, I, there's certain things I just can't do. You know, I had a guy with me, the old man Peruda, and he was dying of cancer, suffering like a dog. And one day when I went to see him, he said, Sammy, I don't want to die this way. He says, kill me. Put a bullet in my head. I said, I can't, bro. I can I can never pull the trigger. I could never be able to do that. I can't. I love you, bro. I can't. You could. I know you could. And uh, he was begging me. And having somebody beg you like that, who you love, I felt, how could I say no? This is the only time the guy ever asked me for anything of importance. And I'm going to tell him no. So I went back. John Gotti was in prison. I sent a message. I had made him on his deathbed, become a made guy. And I asked permission to kill him. And John Gotti said, no, you made him. You made him on his deathbed. We don't kill. We don't do mercy killings. No. And I went back. I felt relieved a little bit. I told him, Joe. I, and John said no. And he said, Fuck John, I don't give a fuck about him. I never did. I love you. I'm asking you. Put me on a spot so fucking bad that I turned around and I said, uh, I'll do it. I went home and and I got my brother law and people. I said, listen, make sure his family's not in the house. He's in the back room where the back door is. Um... Make sure nobody's in the house. I'll come in and uh, I'll put a pillow over his face and I'll put a bullet in his head. I'll make him die the way he wants to die. My wife had said, because it took a little while, what's the matter? I said, no. What's the matter? I said, listen, mind your fucking business. What's the matter? My friend is dying. Yeah. So mind your business. Don't ask me nothing. I had the gun or the silencer ready to go. And the day it was going to happen, I was in my house sick as a fucking dog that I was about to kill one of my best friends in a mercy kill. Uh, I never even thought of doing anything like that. And uh, my wife came in and said, listen, Eddie's on the food. All right, I'm thinking that the house is clear and I'm going to leave. So I get on the phone. I says, is everything done? No, Sammy, did you hear? 